Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphic so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. In a previous broadcast, we've been studying about the prophecies of Jesus Christ and how he is the one that fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, all of them pointed to him, and the shadows and the types that are found in the Old Testament, the specific prophecies, the shadows and the type, all point to Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you this, that Jesus cast a very long shadow in the tabernacle. The way that tabernacle was built, <clears throat> excuse me, and the way that the tabernacle worship was carried on, it was all patterned for Jesus Christ because his shadow was in there. We look in the New Testament, Jesus Christ cast his shadow back across the tabernacle of yesterday. I want to say this before I forget it. You know that the tabernacle was a movable tent. And when they settled in the land of Canaan, they built the temple in Jerusalem, which was patterned after the tabernacle. And so Jesus cast a very long shadow in the tabernacle. Just think about this. <clears throat> we know that those shadows there are not the people. That somewhere there are people standing there and they're casting a shadow. Look at this. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, just like these shadows here, they cast a shadow of three people, but the shadow is not the people themselves and can never with these same sacrifices that is under the law, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus Christ, he didn't give us a sacrifice that was just yearly. Once and for all, he died for our sins. <clears throat> but let's think about the shadows and the types. In Hebrews 8, chapter, verses 4 and 5, I'd like for you to read the entire passages. The gifts according to the law who serve the copy and the shadow. You see that? The copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. And so when we look back to the law of Moses, we recognize that they were a shadow of the things that were to come under the dispensation of Jesus Christ. Now let's think about the tabernacle. I'm going to give you the parts of the tabernacle, and then we'll discuss them. Now first of all, there was the door. We know that everybody that came into the courtyard, they had to come through the door. The door had some significance. They couldn't crawl under the curtains on either side. They had to come through the door. Now then, <clears throat> there was the altar of burnt off, the altar of burnt offerings in which that the animals were actually burned on this altar, burned up as a sacrifice to the Lord. And then there was the brazen labor. This is where the priests had washed themselves before they went into the tabernacle. Each time they went into that tabernacle, they had to stop and to wash themselves before they entered. Now again, we find that the first compartment of this tabernacle, that it was called the holy place. It was a holy place. It had three... <clears throat> different pieces of furniture in there, which we will discuss. 
But then there was the veil separating this compartment from the inside, which was the most holy place. The most holy place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. The Ark of the Covenant, and there was also a golden altar of incense. But as you can see, this is the basic, this is the basic diagram of the tabernacle. Now let's think about it for a little while. Let's think about the door. I am the door, <clears throat> Jesus said. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Those entering into the courtyard of the tabernacle came in for the priest to offer sacrifices for them. Jesus said, I am the door. People understood that. They understood the door of the tabernacle and of the sheepfold. John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You have to go through the door. Now, there are thousands of millions of people that are taught that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. He is not the Son of God, and therefore, he is a great prophet, but he is not the Son of God. But if what we read from Jesus' words from himself, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. There are thousands of millions of little children that are being taught that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. He was a great man, but he wasn't the Son of God because they teach that God has no Son. But Jesus said, now you see whose word you want to take for it, no one comes to the Father except through me. You've got to go through the door. Now then, let's think about this. That there was the altar of burnt offering. The altar of burnt offering is where the animals were actually burned. And think about that for a moment. The altar of sacrifice, of burnt offerings, of burnt sacrifice. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering. Now these are the horns of the burnt offering on the different on the four corners. And he said he'll pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. Now every time they offered a sin offering, that's what would happen. They would put some blood on each of the four corners, and then the blood from the animal would be poured at the base. What did that tell you? Well, of course, when Jesus said that he, his blood was poured out, then they understood that. The Jews understood it much better than the Gentiles at that time. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, no matter what the sin offering was, whether it was an individual or whether it was for the atonement sacrifice that would be offered later, that blood was poured apparently at the base of the altar. And <clears throat> people can understood that, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Think about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is the brazen laver. Now, the brazen laver, if a priest is going into the tabernacle, he has to wash. We mentioned this before. He washes every time. He goes in here, and you can imagine how that he probably would need that after having, uh, you know, cleaned an animal, use his hand to sprinkle blood on the altar, on the horns of the altar. He would wash himself every time, every time. And then he could go into the first part of the tabernacle. Let me mention it because I'll mention it again. This back here, the most holy place, only the high priest could go in there. And he could only go in once a year for the atonement. But let's think about that brazen labor. <clears throat> in the New Testament, Paul wrote to Titus and he said, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The washing of regeneration. We look back to the tabernacle and we find that they washed each time they went into that first compartment 
or even the second, which was only for the high priest to go into. But just think about the washing of, somebody says, what's the washing of regeneration? <clears throat> I don't think it unlikely or that we, uh, that we could actually compare this to what we refer to as renovation. I don't know. I'm sure that you have been to these antique car shows and you have seen very old automobiles restored to showroom quality. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever done that? I'm always amazed that they're able to go in there, somebody drag one out of the hay patch or out of the sagebrush, they drag it to their garage and meticulously take that thing apart and they put it together and they actually renovate it to showroom quality when it was brand new. And when I think about the washing of regeneration, when I think about the renovation, when I think about a person being changed and he has, he has cleansed again as he was when he was a child, that uh, he has been renovated, he has been changed. And that's what Jesus Christ's blood and doctrine can do for a person. He has saved us through the washing of regeneration. And of course we know that the, that the brazen labor was there and they had to wash before they entered into it. Now then, along with the holy place, that was the first compartment. The first compartment of the tabernacle. It was divided by a curtain. Now then, it had the altar of incense, it had the candlestick, and it had the table of showbread. That was the furniture inside, inside the holy place, that first compartment. The holy place contained the altar of incense, it contained the golden candlestick and the table of showbread. Let's look at these items that were in the ark. Now then, when you think about an altar, they would burn incense. You remember this is where Nadab and Abihu got in trouble because they didn't take the fire from the altar outside to burn the incense. Where they got it, I don't know. But God does sent out fire from heaven and destroyed them for it. And so here's the idea that the altar, they burned incense on it continually. The incense, the smoke of that incense would rise and by the light of the candlestick, it would create these beautiful little clouds in there, the smoke in there, and all the colors of the rainbow. And someone would say, well, what did that signify? Well, look at this in Revelations 8 and 3. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And this, of course, is a description of New Testament worship. And just think about the prayers of the saints as, it, as they rise to God is as if it is the sweet smelling incense of yesterday when they were in the tabernacle worshiping, that they should offer it with the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints, of course, arise to God Almighty. And that is through Jesus Christ. And then, of course, there was the candlestick. Now, the candlestick, you can imagine that the, that the tabernacle, that it was a tent and then it was double layered to protect it from rain. It was very dark in there. But, of course, in that first compartment, we see that this would give its light. The golden candlestick. Jesus is the light of the world and or it could refer to the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> Let's look at it. Jesus, 8 and 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In that tabernacle, in that first compartment, you'd grope about. You'd grope about in total darkness, save for the light. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Just think about that that it would give light to the room. Here's another passage that we can look at. John 12. I have come as a light unto the world, 
that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. That we can through him learn about God Almighty, our Father. Again, here is a passage that you might think of the candlestick as being the everlasting gospel of Christ. Referring to those who were willfully lost because they wouldn't believe, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Have a lot of blind men today who do not believe lest the light of the glorious gospel, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so we look at the golden candlestick as being emblematic of the light of the world, Jesus Christ, and also of his great message, which he gave to the world through the everlasting gospel, the light of the gospel. And then there was the table of showbread. You know, the priest ate that bread. Jesus is the living bread, and or this probably refers also to the Lord's Supper. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. What does that mean? Physically hungry, physically thirsty? It means spiritually that we will be provided with the spiritual food and drink that we need. And it's only through Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus cast in a long shadow in the tabernacle, isn't he? John 6 and 51. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... He shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You remember those sacrifices <clears throat> that was made back there? The animal sacrifices? Jesus said that he is the living bread. It's not bread that you can bake and put on. There were 12 loaves, one for each tribe of Israel. The priests ate of it. <clears throat> But Jesus said that I am the bread of life. Think about that. If we follow him, then we'll neither hunger nor thirst after righteousness. Now then, the holy place that we mentioned, and then there is the veil. There was a veil right here that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Why was it there? Well, Remember I said that the priests could come in here, offer their sacrifices, wash and come in here, burn the incense, trim the lamp, supply the, the showbread and even eat of it. But they couldn't go any farther. That is the ordinary priest. To be a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Levi. To be a high priest, you had to be a direct descendant of Moses and Aaron. And there was a veil there a veil that separated the holy from the most holy place. And people just didn't wander in there. Only the high priest could enter. He could only go once a year. When Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom in the standing temple at that time. What did that mean? It meant that since we're all kings and priests, that Jesus has made us kings and priests, that the veil in the temple has been removed and that all of us can have access directly to the Almighty God. That's what that means. And that veil was there for all those years, only the high priest. Only the high priest could go through that veil into that most holy place. Think about that. When Jesus died, the veil was miraculously torn from top to bottom. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19. I'd like for you to read the text of it, but let's look at this. Wherefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. What are you talking about? He's talking to the people. He's talking to Christians. And he said that you have boldness to enter into the holiest, into that most holy place where you better stay out of there. It's sacred. No, through the blood of Christ him being our high priest, that we enter in by a new and a living way, not by the old law, 
which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest that's Jesus over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water think about that that we can enter into, by the reason of our high priest, we can enter into the Holy of Holies. Now then, <clears throat> not only was that veil there, but of course you had the room on the other side. On the other side of that room, there it's described here in Hebrews 9, behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. You know, they're still looking for it. The Ark of the Covenant is not mentioned after the, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, but people are still looking for it. They think it might be somewhere. Well, I don't know, but I know it was here, and it was seen only by the high priest once a year when he went in there. Now, of course, if they moved the tabernacle, the, the Levites could take it down and move it, right? But as far as worship was concerned, they didn't go in there. Nobody went in there. And, of course, here is the golden altar, which is burnt incense, and here's the Ark of the Covenant. Now, think about that. But unto the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for his people's sins. This was the atonement. The atonement, you know, the saying that their sins were rolled forward a year, well, that is somewhat truth. That statement is not in the scripture because, you know, it wasn't an eternal salvation as it is under Christ. They had to do it over. They had to do it over every year. Think about that. And so he offered for himself and for his people's sins. He'd have to do it again next year. But under Jesus Christ, we have eternal redemption. Now then, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. You see the shadow he cast on that tabernacle? With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, as the high priest of yesteryear had to do. Look at this. But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. With his own blood. Once for all, not yearly, having obtained, look at that word right there. That says eternal redemption. And so Jesus Christ he, with his blood, bought eternal redemption for us. We don't have to do it over next year. Jesus don't have to come and die next year. He's done it once and for all. You remember the old song that we sing sometimes, there's power in the blood? I wonder if sometimes we who sing that song really realize how much power is in that blood. You know, John said once when he saw Jesus approaching, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus Christ has obtained eternal redemption for us. Now then, in Leviticus 16, there's something here that I want to share with you that I'm sure was a mystery, a mystery to many people. I can just see young children asking the priest, maybe asking their fathers and mothers, well, why is it that you burn all the sacrifices there on the altar except the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place? Watch this. Shall be carried outside the camp and they shall burn it in fire, their skins, their flesh, and their dung. What is this all about now? You know, I've talked to you about the high priest, that once a year 
he would take the sin offering, the goat and the bull for the sin offering, and he would take it through the veil into the most holy place and sprinkle blood upon the ark of God. They'd do it every year. Now, throughout the year, <clears throat> if they had a sin offering, that was not the atonement that I was speaking about. Well, they would burn the sacrifice right there on the altar. Right there on the altar, they'd burn it up. <clears throat> now, why would they take this one? And I'm sure that many of a young child would ask, them, why did God want them to do that? Well, all they could answer is, that, well, it's the law. That's what he said. There are so many things, you know, in the scriptures today that we could talk about that people could ask, well, why did God do that? In other words, why did God require immersion in water to be added to the church? Somebody said, well, I don't know. Well, God said do it, didn't he? That would be the logical answer. But what about this? Well, look at this. The mystery is solved. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. And the bodies are burned outside the camp. He's talking about what they did in the Old Testament. Here is the mystery. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. How did they know that? You see, this is one of those shadows that is cast how did they know that? How did they know? Well, they didn't know. They carried that animal, that particular animal, always carried him, the body of that animal, kept the blood, but the body of that animal was carried outside the camp. Now, I do not know. I do not know where the cross of Jesus is. I know it's on the hill of Golgotha. But I don't know where it is located. I've never been there, but I'll tell you this. It's outside the gates of Jerusalem. For all of these years that they carried that animal sacrifice for the atonement, outside the, uh, the, the camp, they were acting out that Jesus would die outside the walls of Jerusalem. So Jesus Christ, yes, he cast a long shadow. God is an awesome God. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll free, 1-800-390-7734. Seeking the Lost is sponsored each week by some area churches of Christ.